I was going to try to do a current events topic today, and I was going to try to keep it to just one week. And as I got into it more, I realized I just couldn't do it in one week. So we're going to take a two week on this. So if you were planning to be here today to find out when Jesus is returning, you'll have to come back next week to find out when he's going to show back up. <clears throat> So let's open up with a word of prayer and we'll jump on into this. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the warnings. We thank you for the admonishments. We thank you for how you, you tell us about the return of our Savior. We look forward to that day with all of our hearts, and yet we know that there's much in your word that we don't understand. We pray that you'd give us a, a clear foundation so we can understand the days that we live in so that we might shine for you and know you better. All for Christ's glory. Amen. Uh, Romans 13, 11, being alert and faithful as the battle rages. Uh, as we discuss current events, uh, we talk about the deceiver, we talk about deceiving, we talk about wars, rumors of wars, famines, disease, plagues, all those things that we all know that are in the scriptures. Um, we really have to have a grounded biblical perspective of last days. I mean, I could start talking about Russia and Ukraine and the famine that's going to be here soon and inflation and monetary crisis and all the things that are happening in the world right now. But if you don't have a framework for it, it's just like throwing a dartboard at a puzzle. You don't know what piece you're going to hit. It's going to be a very difficult to, to make any sense out of it and then it's going to be even more trickier to how, how do I relate to that how do I even apply that information so what we wanted to do was do this understanding the present time the word understanding in the Greek there is Ida and it, it means to, to see and perceive it doesn't mean just have intellectual knowledge it means to understand or grasp something so Paul is telling us understand the present times um, there's two words for time in, in, in Scripture in the Greek. One is chronos, which, which we get our word chronograph, um, you know, those type of like our watches and stuff were called chronograph. So it's a measure of the quantity of time. That's not what he's talking about here. When he says understand the present time, he's talking about kiros. And what kiros is, is understanding time marked by special events. Um, it's kind of the quality of the time. So what Paul is saying is, look, as believers, we need to understand, we need to have a clear perception of what is taking place and the events that are marked by biblical understanding. So we're, we're trying to get a grasp of what really is taking place, not only in Paul's day, but in our day especially as we see the whole world going through so many changes. Now here's the most common mistake that a lot of people make in regards to the last days and current events. Most Christians do this. What they do is they take the current event that's happening in the news, and then they try to wrap prophetic scripture around it. They try to make the, 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 the scriptures that talk about prophecy fit somewhere in this current event that's happening. And I'm sure you've all seen this happen. Um, back in the uh, early, late 90s, when the EU was formed, and then you had the Euro formed, um, oh my gosh, you know, first it was three nations and then the talk started happening in, you know, in Christian circles that maybe this is the ten nation beast, the final confederation that Daniel talks about and Revelation talks about. And then it got to eight and then there was all this super excitement like, you know, hey, Jesus is coming back because this is the ten nation confederacy. And then it got to ten and everybody's, you know, packing their bags and cashing out their bank accounts. And then it got to 11 nations, then it got to 15 nations, then it ended up with 27 nations, and all of a sudden people are like, hmm, well, we sure didn't understand that rightly. No, you didn't, because what you're doing is you're taking a current event and trying to make the scripture, prophetic scriptures fit that. It doesn't work. It's, it's the wrong way of going about it. Or when Pope Francis uh, in September in 2015 he, he's speaking to the UN and he said, I come in my own name. Oh my gosh, the Christian blog sites went crazy saying, you know, here he is, John 5, 3, that, uh, you know, if, if he says I come in my own name, that's the mark of the Antichrist. So everyone thought that, you know, Pope John was the, or Pope Francis was the Antichrist. And it just, just went crazy. Or how about this one? 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. Now, if you go, I don't understand that one, well, that means you're young. <laughs> but for some of us, oh my gosh, this thing was like wildfire through the Christian community. I mean, people, people were convinced that this NASA astronaut or NASA engineer, uh, Edgar Wisenhunt, uh, I mean, he had it down to the, to the day almost when Jesus was coming back. Uh, well, he gave himself three days because he said you couldn't know the day or the hour, but he gave himself three days. And, you know, and it really all stemmed from trying to take a, a, 
a current event like 40 years from the birth of Israel, 1948 to 1988, it's 40 years. And so he goes to Matthew 24 and he says that when the fig tree starts to blossom, this generation won't pass away. And, and the problem is if you go to prophetic scripture and just grab different verses and then try to fit them into a current event, you can make anything fit into those things, but that's not how you do it. Now here on the other hand, what you do is you take the prophetic framework and then you examine the current events and see if they fit in to the prophetic scriptures. And this takes a little bit of study in which most Christians don't like to do. But like when Israel became a nation May 14, 44, 48, um, that has biblical significance. Isaiah 66, Revelation 12, you can't have the time clock start without Israel being a nation because everything is wrapped around the, the prophecy start with Israel being a nation. If it hasn't been a nation for 2,000 years, it's pretty hard to start the time clock. Or when Israel captured the, their, their or captured Jerusalem, their capital city in the 67 war, the six day war, um, they have to possess the holy city. Jerusalem has to be part of Israel. So those events fit into a prophetic framework. Those make sense. You have the scriptures that easily verify those events. So during the last week of Jesus was here on earth, the disciples asked a whole lot of questions about when Jesus is coming back. And the thing they asked for the most was, what is the sign, the sign, that would indicate his parousia, his second coming. And if you've been in this class for any length of time, we, we try to use correct biblical words to define biblical ideas as opposed to using just current Christian lingo. So when the disciples wanted to know about Jesus' second coming, they used the word parousia. Okay, sounds like a baby was born. That's that little tone <laughs> in the hospital. Hey, by the way, we did have a baby born this week. Our daughter. Our, our daughter had, had, a, had a little boy born, 11 pounds, 24 inches. I mean, this thing's half as tall as me, you know. Um, and uh, I couldn't believe it. She, she delivered it. and 24 inches. That's a big baby. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, already got, he's already got football scouts looking at him, you know. No. <clears throat> Anyways, well, let's bring this back here. Um, so, so Jesus answers those questions, and that's what always amazes me is that the disciples ask for a sign about his parousia, his second coming, and Jesus takes the time to answer those questions. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately, tell us when will this happen, which would be the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, which he'd already talked about. What will be the sign of your parousia? and the end of the age. So the disciples ask a very specific question. They use a very specific Greek word, parousia, or parousia, depends on what part of the country you're from. It means a being near, or an arrival and a continued presence. It was usually associated with royalty, or leaders, or kings arriving at a community. It was a very precise scriptural word. 24 times, 17 of them it's used for Christ Parousia, his second coming, his return. The other six times it's used is for people that arrive and stay with somebody. So it has a very precise understanding meaning. <clears throat> and when it's used of speaking about the second coming, it's about Jesus's main event, his, his coming and arrival and presence on earth. So, and again, I'm trying to give you just an overview. We've done a lot more studies of this in depth, and I'm not trying to get an in-depth study here. But there are three main events that will be surrounded by the parousias, the second coming. The first one is the resurrection of the dead. Most people think the rapture is the next thing to happen. No, it's not. The first thing that happens is the resurrection of the dead. That's what happens first. Then you have the harpazo, or the snatching up, uh, the violently pulling up the, the, the saints, uh, which we often refer to as the rapture. And then you have the start of the day of the Lord's wrath. Once the, once the church, the saints are removed, the wrath pours out because we have three promises in scriptures that we will not suffer wrath. Doesn't mean we won't go through hard times, but it means we will not suffer the wrath of God. So the disciples let, left the temple, walked away with Jesus that came up to him and calls attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked, I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Then they said, when will this happen? When will this destruction take place? And what will be the sign of your parousia, your coming, and the end of the age? And then Jesus answers the question. Number one, or, and again, I, I don't call these signs 
because there's only one sign of Jesus's parousia, but I do call these indicators, okay? So if I use the word sign, just remember I'm talking about indicators or events that precede the parousia. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. Deception is the name of the game and a deceiver will come onto the scene. You'll hear of wars and rumors of war. See to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen. The end is still to come. Thirdly, nations will rise against nations, kingdom against kingdoms. There'll be famines, earthquakes in various places. Fourth, all these are the beginning of the birth pains. So Jesus equates this, these events as birth pains. These are just, there's more to come. There's more intensity of war, shortages, starvation, death. I mean, not a pretty picture, but the disciples asked, and Jesus is going to give them the explanation. Then after the fourth birth pain, after that period of time, the, the tone changes as Jesus goes on, and he, he ramps it up as to what begins to happen. The fifth sign or indicator, things begin to heat up. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated by all over the world because you are my followers. <clears throat> so once persecution becomes commonplace to those who are following Jesus, any non-believer at that point is not going to be associated with Christians. They will not, nobody is going to suffer for the name of Christ if you're truly or not a child of God. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. So the Lord shares these warnings to the disciples who he then tells to teach the other saints as they come on down the line. But he's telling us this not so that we can have all the answers about what's going to happen, but that we will be able to endure. Okay? I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble or tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So we cannot forget that there's a spiritual battle taking place. It's just not Democrats or Republicans or Russians or Iranians. It, it, it's not that. And if that's, the, if that's your depth of understanding of what's going on in the world, you've got to go beyond that because it's way bigger than that. We are involved in an invisible battle that is easily discerned if you have the right eyes. So the first strategy of the devil was to crush the seed of woman. Ever since the cosmic rebellion, and we're not going to get into that. I've covered that extensively how God created a guardian cherub, the guardian cherub because of certain reasons rebelled, God put out a judgment, then he recreates earth in six days, he places man and woman there, Satan, the fallen angel, the serpent, he sees man and woman come into his former domain, and then he comes in with his deceptive attack upon humanity in the garden, and the serpent has planned and schemed to hinder God's plan from the very beginning on this planet. Satan's number one goal is to make sure God doesn't receive his glory due him. As Jesus says in John 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, once God lays down the rules of engagement from Genesis 3.15, that's when things start to unfold in scriptures. This is probably one of the most key verses in the whole Old Testament to explain what the Old Testament is all about. God said, I will, and he's talking to the serpent, to Satan, to his former guardian cherub, I will put enmity, hatred between you, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Her seed, he will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. And from that verse right there, Satan goes into a mode to try to destroy the seed. As we've looked through all of the Old Testament, everything Satan's doing is to try to find out who the seed will be and try to destroy it before the seed is born or after the seed is born. We saw that with Cain and Abel. Cain is possessed by Satan, 1 John. And all of a sudden, Satan thinks Abel is the promised seed. I mean, it would make sense. He says the seed of woman is going to crush the serpent's head. And so all of a sudden, Cain kills Abel. Well, then Seth comes on the line, and you have the whole race of humanity born. Satan had no idea this plan was going to unfold over 6,000 years. But as we've looked through the genealogy of Christ, 77 generations later, you have the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus, born of a virgin in Bethlehem. Well, obviously Satan's first plan to prevent the birth has failed because the resurrection destroyed that. But now is Christ risen from the dead, hallelujah, and become the first fruits of them that slept. 
For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order, each in, this, in the proper series. Well, what's the series, Paul? Well, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ, when? At his parousia. So when does the resurrection take place? It takes place at the parousia. Then the elect the end will come when the hands over the kingdom to God or the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So there is such a massive battle being waged. Nothing Satan does surprises God, obviously, because God's omniscient. But Satan is doing everything he can to try to frustrate the plans of God. He tried everything he could for almost 4,000 years to prevent the birth of and to stop the birth of the seed of woman, because that was the promised one that God said would crush his head. So Satan knows that's why he tried, and that's what the whole Old Testament is about, Satan trying to crush the seed of woman, prevent the seed or kill the seed as soon as the, the child is born. And that explains what happened with Herod at, at Bethlehem. I mean, it wasn't just Herod being afraid that somebody who's actually born a Jew instead of an Edomite is going to now claim the title King of the Jews. The spiritual battle behind that was Satan finally realized this child born in Bethlehem is the one that is going to crush my head. And so Satan works through governments, corrupt governments, and sends the army out to try to kill the, the baby Jesus. Of course, God made sure that that didn't happen. So now Satan had to shift to a different strategy. If you can't prevent the seed of woman being born, now you've got to go to a new plan B. When the failure of Satan's first plan, Jesus is now in heaven, the serpent's second plan is to steal, kill, and destroy the body, the body of Christ. Jesus made a promise to the church. I think we all know this. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. We all know that promise, right? John 14, 3. <clears throat> What is the only way the devil could prevent the parousia, Jesus coming back for us? I know you have to think like the devil here. It might be easier for some of you, but think like the devil. <clears throat> I mean, basically what I'm trying to say is, okay, we understand for the first 4,000 years what the strategy was, prevent the seed. That plan failed. Now Satan has to have another master plan. The master plan is obviously to prevent Jesus from returning to this planet, which will happen at the Perusia, at his coming. But how do you do that? Well, I mean, you can't build a force field around planet Earth. Um, you can't put up a sign, no trespassing, keep out, you know. I mean, the only way you can do it is, is pre prevent the very reason Jesus is coming from being here. Not only keep people from believing, but those that are believing, eliminate them. The devil's second plan is very clear. Prevent the return of Jesus by eliminating the very reason Christ had promised to come back. This is all Satan has to do is frustrate one promise of God and his claim to being like God the Most High can be validated. Now, we're on the winning side, we know that, but he's got everything on the line. His skin is in the game, literally. And so his one last plan will be maneuver the world into a position where either every single person worships him and there are no other people left that worship Christ. That's the end game. That's where everything is going in current age. The devil's been attacking the body of Christ all along. That's obvious. I mean, we see that from the book of Acts onward. Satan is now going after the body of Christ. But Jesus warned that at one specific moment, those attacks, that persecution will become global and extreme extensive and intensive. I mean, there's countries right now, if you name the name of Christ, you probably won't be alive very long. But the whole world isn't like that. But this is Satan's plan. As you read the book of Revelation, now you start to understand his next plan is global. That is his attack. And he has to work through all of the governments because man is a player in this, so he's got to work through all the governments, all the entities, and he's going to bring all of this together. Now, again, the whole world lies in the bosom of the wicked one. That's obvious, 1 John 5. We know that he's the prince of power of the air. That's obvious, Ephesians 6. So we know that he is working behind the scenes with every government, with every country in the planet. But that doesn't mean he's still in control. 
he has limited control as God's given it to him, and he is going to run with that to the very, very end. And then so Jesus now tells the disciples about this major persecution that will break out. So when you see standing in the holy place, Jerusalem, the temple, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, for then there will be the great tribulation, megathalipsis, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. Okay, now that's a pretty incredible st statement that Jesus just made. We've seen periods of time where the persecution upon believers or other people have been incredibly intense, but it's never been global. This is what Jesus is saying. That's why it'll never be like this ever again. There'll never be another global attack upon the body of Christ. So now this may come as a surprise, but one generation of believers will be here at the Perusia. There will be a body of Christ. There will be one generation of Christians alive at the Perusia. The Lord gave abundant prophetic teaching to ensure that that last generation would be grounded in the truth. Why? Because deception will be so prevalent. That, I mean, you can discern trash and deception on TV when you watch something, you can hear it, and, and, but it's not on a global scale yet. It's not coming at you from every instance. This will be what's going on. That's why the teachings that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, all the other epistles, as well as the entire book of Revelation are all built upon the foundation of the prophetic roadmap from the book of Daniel. See, when Jesus came, he didn't come up with a new plan. He used the plan God gave Gabriel to give to Daniel, and that's why Jesus says, listen to what I'm saying and go back and read the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 specifically, but Daniel, the prophet Daniel. So Daniel received this prophetic revelation concerning end times. And I'm going to touch on this just super briefly so you just know where I'm at. The roadmap centers around Israel and Jerusalem, obviously, but it does include the entire world. So Daniel 9, we've covered this extensively before, 77s are decreed. The word uh, there in the Hebrew, it means cut off, hacked off. It means it's, it's cut off in a special way. There, there's a period of time that God has cut off from all of their human history to accomplish something very specific for his purposes. So 77s are decreed for your people and your city to finish transgressions, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. Basically, God's saying, this period of time of 77s, I'm going to wrap up everything that I've been planning for all eternity. It'll be wrapped up. Well, how much is 77s? I mean, what in the heck's that talking about? It's a timeline. It's 77 year periods or a total of 490 years, okay? I won't get into all the Hebrew and the words of getting it all explained, but let me just try to give you just a, a, a snapshot here so you we can follow me to the end. No one understand this, that the Gabriel's prediction from God, the prophecy from God continues. From the time the decree goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the King comes, there will be 69 sevens, 483 years. Basically, Daniel receives this while he's in captivity in Babylon. There is no Jerusalem. There is no Israel. He receives this, and it says it's going to be about Jerusalem and Israel. And the, Daniel looked at him and like, uh, there is no Israel right now. There's no Jerusalem. It was decimated. And so it needs a starting point. This period of 490 years needs a starting point. He gave him that starting point when the decree goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. There was a whole bunch of decrees from Cyrus that went out about Jerusalem, but not until Artaxerxes Longimanus in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, 445 B.C., that decree goes out. You can read that chapter Nehemiah, chapter 1. That's why that chapter's in there, because that is this exact decree that's going out to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. That's when that decree happened. That's when this 490 years started. Well, there's a problem. It stops when the Messiah comes. Well, when did the Messiah come? Well, that's when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be king at exactly on that specific day, 173,883 days from that time Artaxerxes signed that decree until Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Remember, a lot of times people wanted to make Jesus king. They said, you know, they wanted to make him king early, and they wanted to make him king early, and he never did it. He always slipped away and disappeared and vanished, and it was like, 
Why? Don't, isn't that the whole point? No, because it had to happen on one specific day. And that's why when you go to Luke chapter 21, Jesus says, if you would only have known this day, this specific day, that this would have brought you peace because the king rode in to Jerusalem, <clears throat> their Messiah, what they've been waiting for for thousands of years, he finally shows up and they miss it. And this prophecy was mathematical. Any scribe, any Pharisee should have known that this is the day, out of all the days on planet Earth, this day, the one that Jesus rode in on the donkey and proclaimed himself as king and let himself be proclaimed as king was the day that foretold in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. So, God said there'd be 490 years. We had 483 years when Jesus rode in on the donkey. What's missing? Seven years left. Where are the seven years? Well, if you go back to Daniel's prophecy, you realize they weren't concurrent. There was a pause. There was a hold. The clock was stopped because there's a few other things that have to happen. But when does the last seven years start? That's the real, real question. When does it start? Well, verse 27 of Daniel 9, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, seven year period. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation till the end that is decreed is poured out upon him. Hmm. That's where Jesus gets his information from Daniel 9, 27. So basically what's happening, the he is the Antichrist. It is a regional leader at this point, at the beginning of the seven-year seven period. He will strengthen or confirm an alliance, a treaty, or a pledge. That's what the word means in the Hebrew. It can mean all of those. It could mean that there's an existing treaty, and he strengthens it or reconfirms it, or it means he could come up with a new pledge or a new treaty. Any of those could be applicable with the many, it's an idiom for Israel, for a seven-year period of time. This treaty will look like a good deal for Israel. Nobody makes a treaty unless it has some benefit for the people involved. So a regional leader will make a treaty or a covenant or strengthen one with Israel that will look beneficial to both parties, okay? However, it would seem that this would allow the Jewish nation, after all of history, 2,000 years to, to reinstate animal sacrifice because we know animal sacrifices has to be going on for him to stop it. You, you can't have something not happening to stop it if it isn't already happening. And so somehow, and, I, and this is just pop, this is sanctified speculation, that this treaty might have something to allow animal sacrificing because we know animal sacrificing is taking place according to 2 Thessalonians. We know that it's taking place there at the temple, but we don't know exactly what starts it. But I'm assuming if this covenant is made or this treaty is strengthened, that it would allow the Jews to start after 2,000 years animal sacrifice. You talk about one thing that would bring Judaism to the forefront of their whole religion would be to have temple sacrifice once more, because right now they can't do it. The only thing they've got is what's left over from the fall of, of uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD. And the only reason we have what we have is because the Pharisees were based in the small communities. The Sadducees were all based in <clears throat> Washington, D.C., kind of Jerusalem. And when the Romans came in, they just they lost all power. But the Pharisees were all scattered out in the little synagogues all throughout the communities. Those synagogues kind of spread out for the last 2,000 years. So the Jew, the Jewish religion you see today is mostly based on the Pharisees' interpretation of scriptures. So there's going to be temple sacrifice. And I know you say, well, that just seems impossible. Well, back in 1947, it seemed impossible that Israel would ever become a nation again because they didn't exist. And that's why so many biblical prophetic teachers taught that all the promises of Israel now got transferred to America and or to the church globally. And I mean, it made sense because it's like, well, you don't have Israel, so I guess the promises go to the church. No, here you go. You're taking a current event and trying to make scripture fit it, and that's not the way you do it. Because one year later, Israel's reborn. All of a sudden, all those teachers tried to retract their books as fast as they could because they were wrong. So now Israel will learn in the middle of that seven-year period, three, three and a half years into it or 1,260 days into it because it's on a biblical 360-day year, that they made a pact with the great deceiver with the Antichrist themselves. And that's when a tremendous amount of persecution is going to break out globally. So there's a link to understand the final seven years, okay? Daniel received the foundation 
of the seven-year roadmap. Of course, he received the 490 years, but we're specifically talking about that final seven years because that's what we're trying to understand. Jesus expanded the events and the sign about those seven years. <clears throat> so you have the, the Daniel lays the roadmap down. Jesus builds on top of it. And then 60 years later, and this is what always boggles my mind, 60 years later, Jesus sends his angel to an island in the Aegean Sea where John is held up at Patmos. And of all the things the church could have had better explanations of, baptism, uh, the gospel, uh, an evangelistic plan to reach the world, uh, clarifying the doctrine of head covering or woman's role or current events, abortion, homosexuality, all of these things could have been covered in 22 chapters. I mean, if you're going to take up paper writing, why not cover something like that? Jesus comes back <clears throat> through his angel and gives a clarification and an expansion of Daniel's roadmap for end times. I mean, that blows my mind. I mean, and then people say, well, it's not that important. Prophetic scripture is not that important. Well, it's going to be important for one generation because one generation is going to walk through this with eyes wide open. So Daniel 9, 24 through 27, <clears throat> that lays out the roadmap. That lays out your, your floor plan, so to speak. Beginning point, midpoint, end point gives us the time frames in between and does tell us that it's going to start with a covenant. <clears throat> it's going to be interrupted with an abomination of desolation. And there's going to be a final judgment for the Antichrist. Hallelujah. Okay, we got that down. Jesus comes in in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and in the epistles as well. They expand it in saying that the covenant signing is the coming of the deceiver. The abomination links these things together like chains. And then the parousia of Jesus Christ will be what brings that judgment upon the wicked one. And then Revelation 6 explains that the covenant signing, the, the coming of the deceiver, is connected to the first seal of the scroll that's opened. The abomination of desolation is that main persecution in the seal number five, which links it together. And then, of course, seal six is the sign. That was what the disciples were actually asking. What is the sign that will tell us that your, your appearance is imminent? And Jesus says, number six is the sign, which is the sun goes dark, moon turns blood red, all the stars in heaven go out, I mean, whether it's universal, I think it is, everything gets shut off for just a few moments, and then you know what comes back on? The Shekinah glory of Christ coming back to this planet to reclaim it for himself and to start the judgment upon the wicked one. So all of those things connect together. Questions on that? Good, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'll pause for just a moment. <clears throat> Any questions on that? <clears throat> we are recording this. This will be on YouTube later, so you can go back over it <clears throat> and re-listen to it. So let me wrap it up with the last slide here. <clears throat> Next week, what I'll try to do <clears throat> is take current events, the things that are leading to current events, <clears throat> and then hold them up against Scripture of what it will look like in the final days, and then be able to draw lines to show you how close we are or how far we are and what you might want to do as a Christian in order to be wisely, prudently prepared for those days. But the most important thing we need to be prepared with is maturity. We have got to keep working on our spiritual growth. I mean, the world has changed. In the last two, two and a half years, um, unless you've been sleeping, things have really gone different. Unfortunately, sometimes Satan's plan is to happen it slowly, make the change slowly so that you just become lethargic once again. It's like after 9-11, you know, and I'm not saying that's a prophetic event, I'm just saying 9-11. I mean, people were piling into church and praying and, oh, God, I just confessed my sins. Three weeks later, they're back watching, you know, housewives shows and cooking shows. And, I mean, everything. everyone's back to their old schedules again. It's like Satan knows how lethargic people can be. <clears throat> but the events of the last couple of years have really changed things. You say, well, why? What's different between that and something else? Here's why. When there are big movements that affect the world, you can be sure there's a big spiritual development raging. See, because... The physical is just a manifestation of the spiritual that's raging and taking place. I mean, like, oh, maybe just like in 2 Kings uh, 6, where Elijah and his servant um, 
the, the servant comes out and he sees the physical soldiers all surrounding the city trying to capture Elijah. But then Elijah prays that God would open his eyes, and then he sees there's another whole spiritual dimension. There's a whole spiritual battle raging, and that's what's happening here. We've got all kinds of weird things happening on earth with the countries and the wars and the, and the, and the monetary system. We've got all kinds of strange things happening, and I'll try to cover all those next week. But there's a whole development, of, a spiritual development behind those things that are taking place. Um, you know, like when Jesus was crucified, it wasn't just the Pharisees and the Romans that hated Jesus, and it was just a one-dimensional battle. No, behind that battle, I mean, this is what we see recorded in Scripture, but behind that battle, we understand that it was Satan and his entire forces that were trying to crush Christ and destroy him. I mean, we, we've got to, as believers, see the invisible with our spiritual discernment. So he's wanting to distract, discourage, and distance you. And I'm telling you, have you ever noticed how a week can go by and it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even open my Bible this week because this was this and this was crazy. I mean, it, it can happen slowly, but more than anything else, we've got to stay sharp spiritually. The adversary knows, and this is why he wants to have you stay in baby diapers spiritually, because he knows that as the days become more difficult, God is going to seek and use in mighty ways men and women young men, young women, kids, boys and girls that are serious about knowing God and making him known. In other words, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro looking for those whom he may strengthen and strongly support. God is wanting to use us individuals, broken, chipped, cracked vessels with all of our flaws and all of our problems so that his glory can be manifested through it, that his glory can be shown to the world. He's looking for broken people and most of you qualify. Uh, <laughs> I think all of you qualify. <clears throat> And we'll wrap it up with this. The children of Ishakar. remember we talked about the, the, the sons of Ishakar. And remember what was happening was that the house of Saul was fading from the scene. And this was huge, huge, big, big news. And the house of David was beginning to rise. And there were very few people that had the spiritual discernment to see what is God actually doing? What is the Spirit of the Lord actually accomplishing? And the sons of Ishakar had the spiritual discernment to see not only what was taking place, but also the spiritual dimension that was raging. And they were the ones that had a clear understanding of the changing times. They realized the house of Saul was falling because of his spiritual maturity and his rebellion and pride. And they saw the house of David rising because not only Samuel had anointed him, he was God's prophet, he had anointed David, but they also could see the David, the boy, the man, becoming the type of king God was going to use. They knew what was taking place. They knew what needed to be done. And those were the individuals who were leaders, leaders guiding and helping others. In other words, God will use those that have the spiritual discernment to see what's taking place and the maturity to grow and not be distracted. He'll use those to become leaders and guides to help everyone else. So be like the children, the sons of Ishakar. And then next week, what we'll do is try to fit current events, that stuff you hear about in the news all raging, we'll try to fit it into the prophetic puzzle and have a biblical framework for it. So now do you see why I just couldn't start talking about Russia or Ukraine or the famines or how the whole world's gonna change with these sanctions? I mean, so much is going on, but unless you've got a biblical framework, none of it's gonna make any sense. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its challenging. Thank you that you, you want us to be students of your word so that we can grow, but mostly so that we can glorify you in these days. We give you all the praise. Amen.